Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Family Heirloom Preservation Clinic. I am Karim D. Souza, Library Technical Assistant at the Preservation and Conservation Laboratory, Heritage Library Division, NALIS. We ask you to keep your cameras off and your mics muted. You are invited to type your questions into the chat or question and answer segment at the end of this webinar. Let me introduce to you our organ's institution. The National Library Information System Authority of Trinidad Tobago, NALIS, is the country's coordinator of all library and information services. Beyond the Heritage Library, there are over 25 public libraries, three libraries and correctional institutions, libraries in secondary and primary schools, and special libraries in several government agencies, all administrated by NALIS. I encourage you to visit our website, www.nalis.gov.tt, for more information about our services. We are, will post the link in the chat below. One of NALIS's key responsibilities is to promote and preserve national heritage information. Though the National Library has a comprehensive collection of paper-based items and electronic audiovisual media, they are particular emphasis on materials with national and Caribbean origin, focus on archbishop. The Heritage Library Division, located on the second floor of the National Library Building, Port of Spain, Trinidad, helps NALIS fulfills the goal of acquiring, promoting, and preserving national heritage information. Follow the Heritage Library Division on Facebook at NALIS HLD TT. See the link in the chat. Some special collections acquired or donated to the Heritage Library Division consist of mainly traditional library items created by or of interest to significant person or organization of Trinidad and Tobago. One would not be surprised to find within the collections books, newspapers, pamphlets, photographs, letters, films, and audio recordings. However, within several collections housed in the rare books room of the National Library, they are mixed up of items often labeled memorabilia. So in a sense, we are focused on preservation of the collective heirlooms of our Trinbigo family. The Preservation and Conservation Laboratory is responsible for ensuring the overall longevity of the library materials with specific information on the Heritage Library Division and its collection of historical importance. The PSC Lab, which is officially commissioned in 2013, has now fulfilled its role as an international federation of library association institutions, preservation and conservation, IFLA, PSC, Regional Center of the English Speaking Caribbean. Additionally, this arm of Heritage Library Division advises the public and private organizations on the care of their collection and artifacts. The PSC Laboratory has been serving preservation and conservation needs of clients through fumigation, freeze drying, conservation treatments, collection repair, boundary services, disaster recovery, technical assistance, and preservation training. Take a narrative virtual tour at a preservation lab using the link in the chat. We miss carrying out our preservation clinics, tours, and training sessions in person. However, we are happy that technology allows us to continue this mission through the this preservation webinar series. Let me introduce to you today, the facilitator, Daniel Fraser. Since 2009, Daniel has served as a library conservator and head of PAC lab. Daniel holds a master of science in information studies and a certificate in advanced studies in conservation and laboratory and archival materials from the University of Austin, Texas. She has a, she was a 2008 conservation fellow at the Library of Congress, Washington, DC. She has been a member of the American Institute of Conservation and Library Association of Trinidad and Tobago. 
Daniel enjoys presenting papers at annual meetings, regional association, including Acryl and Curl. So I know she's looking forward to presenting the webinar today for you all. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you so very much, Kareem. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. In last month's clinic, we looked at tips and remedies to preventing damage by light and ultraviolet light. Today, we will look at another agent of deterioration, dust, which is considered an airborne pollutant contaminant. Now remember, preservation is all about understanding the 10 agents of deterioration as the primary threat to our collections and taking steps to avoid, block, detect, and respond to the damage they cause. So what is dust? Dust is an airborne solid pollutant containing particulate matter or fine particles. We may think of dust as a uniform, inert, aerodynamic material. However, dust can vary from fine, that is, with a diameter of 2.5 micrometers or less, to super coarse, more than 10 micrometers. And remember, one micrometer is one millionth of a meter. These particles can hold a range of organic and acidic contaminants which can react with surfaces. Dust is also hygroscopic, meaning that it readily absorbs moisture from the air. So dust on an object brings both moisture and contaminants. And this combination can speed up the chemical processes that lead to chemical deterioration of our family heirlooms. The dust we typically find in our homes and workplaces is a very interesting mix. And I'd like you right now to put into the chat, what do you think is in our dust that we would find in our homes or in our workplaces? What exactly is inside of dust? You see here a microscopic image of some house dust, but what are all these various components? So I'm going to the chat and I'm looking for your answers. I wonder if anyone would guess the various things that we have inside of dust. So you're using the chat and you're just putting in what you speculate could be contained in dust. Excellent. Now, a lot of people are saying dead skin skin cells. Yes, but surprisingly, dead skin cells actually make up only one third of the components of dust. And we see folks who are saying uh, hair, skin, plant material, we have fur, microbes, bits of paper, food crumbs, fabric bits, uh, mites, maybe even paint. Some excellent, excellent responses. Thank you so very much for them. And the mix of dust, yes, dead skin cells, like I say, make up about a third of that. Hair, fur, if you have animals or pets, there may be textile fibers. Bacteria, we actually do have dust mites. These are tiny, tiny insects that actually live and eat dust. You may have fragments or bits of dead bugs. There's also going to be soil particles or what we consider dirt. Uh, there will more than likely be pollen as well as microscopic specks of plastic. We're living in a world with more and more plastics than we may even imagine. Thank you so much for your answers. Now, the thing about dust is that the accumulation of dust can be very attractive to insects. It would actually provide a nice haven for them possibly to hide if they're tiny enough, as well as it provides a ready source of nutrients. 
if you took part in our last webinar where we spoke about mold, you remember me mentioning that mold spores can be carried in dust and objects also can suffer abrasion from large and sharp particles of dust. And when dust settles, it can cause soiling on the surface of our collection items. So that unsightly appearance lowers the aesthetic value of your object. Once ingrained in the surface of paper and other very porous surfaces, dust cannot be completely removed using any measure of conservation techniques. So as with most of these agents of deterioration, prevention is much better than the cure. But before we get into talking a little bit more about that aspect of prevention, I want to put a special note here with respect to the Caribbean region. Sahara dust is one that I think all of us in the Caribbean are very much aware of. It's a mineral dust that is blown by strong seasonal winds from North Africa, from the Sahara Desert. According to NASA, each year, more than 180 million tons of dust are blown from the Sahara Desert. These plumes of dust typically go over the Atlantic to the Americas. Though some Saharan dust has been reported to reach to the Mediterranean, to Europe, and to other regions, even as far as Japan. As the dust travels further, the large particles would fall to the surface, uh, while the smaller ones are able to be carried very far distances in the wind. Saharan dust, though, we should understand, serves an important role in the Earth's climate and biological systems. It absorbs and reflects solar energy. The dust also helps to fertilize land and ocean ecosystems with iron and other minerals that plants and phytoplankton need to grow. However, especially if you're an allergy sufferer, we are quicker to recognize the effects of Saharan dust on air quality. High Saharan dust concentrations often bring increased cases of asthma, bronchitis, and acute respiratory infections. If you've been following the news, you would note that just recently, La Soufre volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines became active after being mostly dormant for some decades. The explosive eruptions earlier this month caused massive evacuations from the red zone areas in the north of the island of St. Vincent. The massive plumes of volcanic ash spewed high into the atmosphere. The ash not only fell or affected uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but was also, also had a big impact on Barbados. The thing about volcanic ash is that it's a little bit different to dust. So it's not exactly the same. Unlike dust, which tends to sometimes be a bit softer, volcanic ash is hard. It's abrasive, it's slightly corrosive, as well, it's electrically charged and it cannot be dissolved in water. In fact, we've seen some images following rainfall where accumulations of ash outside actually became so very hard and concentrated and compacted that it looked almost like concrete. Ash contain volcanic ash, contain mostly fragments of rocks, minerals, and volcanic glass. The larger rock fragments usually fall back to the ground close to the volcano. The small fragments are blown away by the wind. And here is a microscopic view of shards of volcanic gas, glass, sorry, collected 12 kilometers from the source at Mount Etna in 2002. So I just wanted to put a special note there that in our atmospheric um, conditions here in the Caribbean, we tend to have more than just simply house dust. 
we are affected by the Saharan dust um, annually and on this unfortunate occasion of the La Soufre volcano becoming active, we're also affected um, in some parts by the volcanic ash. So it's useful to take a risk management approach to ensuring long-term use and access to our collections and family heirlooms. When we consider the damage potentially caused by dust, we should take steps with our collection to avoid, block, detect, respond, and recover. Cleaning objects can be time consuming and it could be costly. So it's better to put measures in place to prevent dust from accumulating. So let's take a look at some of those prevention measures. First, when we consider a void, you should look at minimizing uh, the entry points for dust at your location, as well as the activities that are potentially dust producing or activities which would drive dust or lift dust off of areas and recirculate them into your space. Here are some, strateg some strategies for blocking this agent of deterioration. We can look at improving the air tightness of our buildings. Note where the location of the fresh air intake for air conditioning units is located. Is it located near to where there might be dirt or perhaps in areas that are on the street level where you have a lot of traffic and um, vehicular activity? That may be a consideration for the amount of dust you're having being pulled into your building through your air conditioning units. Also, the use of protective enclosures is one that can help put a physical block between the object and the dust in our um, spaces. And it's important to inspect and monitor the collection regularly. You should be looking for signs of dust accumulation, signs of the deterioration that it brings on the objects and on your enclosures periodically. And dust removal can include regular vacuuming of floors, your mats, your general spaces. That should happen on a schedule, especially in institutions and in our spaces where we have our collections stored. Consider as well periodic cleaning of windowsills door traps, filtration systems, and other areas where dirt can potentially enter the building. Now, regular dusting of the objects themselves must be done with appropriate materials. So when it comes to books, here's what we can do. Using a soft microfiber cloth or a dust magnet cloth, remove the dust from a book starting along the edges of the pages. Hold the book tightly closed while cleaning to ensure that it does, the dust does not go down in between the pages of the book. So I am now about to just demonstrate with a book of mine here. I'm using a very soft microfiber cloth. And just as the images say on the screen, you ought to start from the spine going out towards the edge of the book. You ought not to pass the cloth in the reverse because that could actually cause the dust to fall in between the pages. And then once you're doing this four edge, again, you want to always be passing the cloth off the edge and off the edge as opposed to in the opposite direction. That can cause some problems where that dust can actually get into the book. And again, on the surface of the book itself, you want to move from the center out, never from out into the cover of book when you're wiping. So from the center out in all directions around would be the appropriate way for wiping off dust. And I'm actually a little bit surprised that my book <laughs> is rather dusty. Um, some of the dust was captured directly on the cloth. Uh, the purpose of using a microfiber cloth is that it has all those tiny fibers woven into it. And those are able to grab and lock the dust in place as opposed to just using a duster or a feather duster or some other cloth that doesn't work. 
country can end up now with the dust just simply recycling into the air and not actually being captured. Brush an item using soft natural hair brushes in, conjunc in conjunction with a vacuum. A high efficiency particulate air or HEPA or HEPA filter vacuum will help prevent small particles from escaping and recirculating in the air. We use a vacuum that has adjustable suction speed as well as detachable and differently sized nozzles. We use our HEPA filter vacuum within the space of a fume hood. The fume hood provides um, a safe method of containment of the particles where they are exhaust into the exterior. So we are at the end of looking at dust as one of the agents of deterioration. Thank you so much for your participation and for your attention. Feel free to put your questions and it can be anything about your family heirlooms. It does not have to be restricted to dust itself in the chat or you can email me. My email address is up on the screen. We will also email you a list of resources as it relates to dust and a brief survey. Your feedback is going to be important to us as we look forward to your responses in order to help us improve. So just before I take the questions and perhaps um, Kareem would assist me with them, I want to mention to you that on Wednesday, May 12th, I invite you to join us for our webinar, Care and Handling. We'll look at some tips and recommendations for the care and handling of books, documents, photographs, audiovisual, and other items in your library and archival collections. Also join us on Wednesday, May 26th at 1 p.m. local time for our next Family Heirloom Preservation Clinic. In this time, we'll explore tips and techniques for selecting protective enclosures for your treasured family items. The registration links are posted in the chat. And so now we, I look towards taking your questions. Okay, just being sure that I am seeing the correct questions. My apologies for the long pause. So we have a question from N. Fletcher. How often should you change the filter in your HEPA, va um, HEPA vacuum? So the question again, how often should I change the filter in my HEPA filter, in my HEPA vacuum? The vacuums, are really more, um, you ought to follow the directions given by the manufacturers or the ones that came with your model. Uh, so I don't want to particularly zone in on a, on a length of time, but I think most HEPA filters are more physical filters as opposed to being um, filters that are absorbing chemicals. So it's more a matter of them eventually getting clogged and not functioning effectively. And so most manufacturers would have recommendations as it relates either to a length of time based on regular use, or um, perhaps there might be a vacuum that would indicate if the filter has to be changed or giving you a particular um, timeline or a, 
a light or something like that to indicate when the filter has to be changed. But as opposed to filters that absorb chemicals, which often have to be changed, um, even if you're not actively using it because they are actively absorbing it from the environment, HEPA filters are more physical filters. And so is a matter of them becoming blocked. So if you're using it very infrequently, um, you would change that filter less than if it's something that you're using on a very regular basis. We have another question. How do I repair 1849 family Bible that is deteriorating and how do I store it to prevent that? Wow, that is so amazing that you have a family Bible dating to so far back. Um, kudos to your family members for keeping it for so long. And I know that you would want to have that family Bible remain as long as possible. Now, there are um, repair steps that are available online generally, but I say that with some caution and I don't want to recommend a particular repair technique because of course conservators as well as um, book binders are trained for a period of time so that they have that skill to be able to restore or to repair an item. So trying it out just using a YouTube that's going to be at your own risk. Um, however, I can definitely advise you on storing it in order to prevent that deterioration. Now, I just want to go back very quickly to the uh, slide as it relates to agents of deterioration. And though we focus on just simply one for today's clinic, we focus just on dust and particulates. Um, there are several agents of deterioration. And the same way we mentioned that you ought to be able to block them, reduce the exposure, um, avoid it, detect it, and do some sort of response. So all of these play on the condition of your collection item. So perhaps you'd want to be sure that you are storing it just very generally. You are storing it in relatively cool temperatures, right? Also relatively low relative humidity and with low light levels, as well as, of course, in an enclosure. We are actually going to be speaking about enclosures in our clinic in May. I encourage you to join us on that. We'll speak on some of the options for enclosures as it relates to books, photographs, documents, etc. So I think that would also be rather useful as well. Now, one thing to consider about um, our books, we may think, well, no, I want to repair it maybe waiting until you can have a professional take a look at it and give you that necessary advice and walk you through that process or do the process of repairing for yourself. The steps that you, th you take in order to store and to handle and to um, you know, keep it in good condition are going to be just as valuable as if you had repaired it. Those things can have a major impact on the overall uh, quality of the item. So don't downplay um, working out and preventing the agents of deterioration. That can have a big impact on your collection. And Daniel, how should one repair an old family album from the 1960s? Sorry, can you repeat that question? How should one repair an old family album from the 1960s? A family album. So uh, I'm assuming this came from N. Greer. Uh, not that, yes. that name correctly. Uh, so I'm assuming it's the album itself that has some damage as opposed to the photographs in the album. Uh, photo conservation is one that does take a bit of training and you have to um, be sure that you're doing that correctly. However, if it's an album itself, one of the recommendations as it relates to the album would be to replace it with materials that are not, that are archival quality. 
and by archival quality, we're referring to the items being um, acid-free, pH neutral, um, also with the items not having any additives or fillers, etc., that could be potentially damaging to the photographs. As it relates to photographs, these materials should have passed what is called a photographic activity test, a test done and um, instituted as an ISO, an international standard for materials that should come in contact with photographs. So that's a, a bit of a lengthy answer, but I want to end it by making a recommendation to you that we actually did a webinar um, on the introduction to the care of photographs. And so we have that available as a YouTube video on the NALIS YouTube channel. I recommend taking a look there. We did in fact go through in a bit more detail as it relates to photographs and what you should do with respect to just handling them, caring for them, et cetera. Another question here. What elements cause paper heirlooms to fade over the years? What can be done to preserve it? That's coming up from Primus. What elements cause paper? What heirlooms to fade over, heirlooms. Mm -hmm. Heirlooms to fade. To fade over the years. Now, uh, it so happened that our last clinic was one where we focused on light and UV light. So the damage caused by light is typically what would cause items to fade. And I say typically because sometimes it might just be the factors of the chemicals inside of the materials themselves that just cause that inner deterioration to happen. Perhaps the inks might be ones that were not very um, permanent. And so they eventually fade over time, regardless of um, them being in light or not, or being in complete darkness, they may very well still fade. And so based on whether these items are exposed to light or perhaps that the items themselves have an inherent quality that causes deterioration, those are the things that would factor into a paper heirloom fading. Now, the question is, what can be done to preserve? And that's what I hope we're helping everyone with through our preservation webinar series. Each series we zone in, sorry, each webinar of the series, we have been zoning in on one particular uh, type of preservation challenge or topic. And so, like I mentioned, we had done one on the care of photographs. We also did our last clinic on the effects of light and UV. The, those two are also available online as YouTube videos on the NALIS YouTube channel. So I encourage you to visit and take a look there at those um, webinars. There's one more question I'm seeing here. Is the dust removal process the same machines or diet? That's a really interesting question, asking if the dust removal process is the same for um, equipment, uh, for instance, sewing machine or um, utensils, etc. Now, the good thing about uh, those other items is that they're not necessarily as porous as books are, as materials, as um, the materials that we have in our library and archival collections. So your cleaning methods or your dust removal methods for that could actually be a bit more um, extensive in the sense of you, you may not have to necessarily restrict yourself to getting an extremely soft cloth or an extremely soft brush. You can, and it's probably maybe for the best, especially if it's an extremely old or brittle or fragile item. But if it's one that can withstand um, some of that cleaning, then you can use some different materials to that. But that same aspect of either using a cloth, a soft brush, along with a vacuum would be good ways of containing dust because the thing about using other items is that sometimes they shift the dust off of the item and then 
have it recirculate into the air. So you don't want that that occurs. And so you want something that would either contain the dust or be able to capture it like a vacuum would. So those are some of the things to consider as it relates to other equipment. As with any general process that you do on an item that you're doing for the first time, that you're not sure how it's going to turn out, all conservators always would do some, some form of testing. And so I recommend that perhaps you test whatever method you agree on or you think would be working best for that dust removal on the equipment or on an old cast iron, that you test on an underside or an area that's you know, not too very obvious, that you do a small test with whatever material you're using, be it the vacuum, be it a soft brush, be it a microfiber cloth or a, cotton, a soft cotton cloth, that you do that testing in an inconspicuous space first and then proceed to dealing with the rest of the item itself. In reference to the YouTube links, they are asking if you can send it to them. So I'm guessing you will email the links to everyone. Yes, I will do that. Um, this webinar is also being recorded and we will be emailing this as soon as it's uploaded to the YouTube channel. But that is something that I can do. I can email the YouTube links to our previous webinars to everyone who would have registered for today's webinar. That's a great idea. Thank you for that request. I just wanna, just talking machinery and I love the fact that we're coming to ideas and suggestions. I see from Walker, we see here, the person is mentioning that with machinery, if you need to clean an area with moving parts, you would also have to remove old lubricant and reapply an appropriate new lubricant. And again, make sure that you're doing that according to the model, according to the manufacturer's guidelines as it relates to the machine and the needs of doing that sort of, um, that sort of cleaning on the machine. But thank you so very much for that input. Just one more input on that. Just make sure your machine is turned off before doing any cleaning. Definitely, yes. It's so easy to forget that we, we don't have to turn on or off books or documents. So I completely forgot about that aspect, but definitely once you're cleaning anything that is electrical, uh, you want to remove it from the power source. That's a good point. And at this time, there are no further questions coming in. So if you can share once again what's coming up for the other family heirlooms, Daniel. Great, definitely. Oops. Let me just get back to that slide. I invite all of you to join us for care and handling. So we have been exploring different topics and we realized that the aspect of simply just how you hold, how you use, how you read, how you access, how you photocopy, how you store on a shelf, uh, how you pack into a box. Those are all the various things that we will put some consideration to as it relates to care and handling, because these are things that do impact the health of our collection. Also, I look forward to having you join us for our next Family Heirloom Preservation Clinic. Feel free to send your questions in advance or save your questions like you did today to ask them at the end. But we're gonna focus on how to go about selecting the appropriate protective enclosures for your treasured family heirlooms. So we look forward to sharing that information on should you need a box? Would any box do? What are the materials? that should be considered when thinking about using a box or getting an enclosure? Is it better to have paper versus plastic? You know, those are some of the things that we're definitely looking forward to sharing on. Okay, great, I just wanna say thank you for everyone on my behalf. I hope to see you soon for the next webinar. Yes.
Thank you so very much, everyone. Do continue being safe.